when you come to church and you worship God. Somebody say amen. When you come into the presence of God, listen to me, church. When you come into the presence of God with expectation, something happens. But if you come with no hope whatsoever, here I am, I'm here again, come with this uh, uh, bummed out spirit, ain't nothing going to happen. Look at your neighbor and tell him, ain't nothing going to happen. But if we come into the presence of God hungry, how many hungry people do we have in the house of God? When you come into the church house, if you come hungry, I can guarantee you, you will be fed today. Amen, somebody? Quickly, let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. Is it 13? Matthew 16. Just three chapters up ahead. I'm just getting the, paving the road. Exit number, Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Let's read, I think I'm going to pick it up from verse 13 rather than 15. Matthew 16, there's a heavy conversation that's happening between Jesus and the disciples. I don't know if you've ever been in a heavy conversation with somebody that it gets intense, and that's what is happening here. An intense, heavy conversation. You don't want to miss it. Are you there? Say amen. amen. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people in the country say I am? They reply, well, Jesus, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah or some uh, Jeremiah or, or perhaps one of the prophets. But then Jesus looks at them and says, but what about you? Look at your neighbor and tell them, what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and we love you. And we ask you for the next few moments that we're here. We worship, we praise you, but now as we get into your word, we ask you to minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name, we all shout. Amen. Amen. Let's pick it up in verse number 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, anybody would have jumped up and got happy that he got the right answer. But Jesus said something to him in verse 17. He said Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by your own flesh and blood, but it was my Father in heaven who revealed it to you. And I got something to tell you, verse 18. He says, and I will tell you something, that you are Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Somebody shout amen. amen. Here's what I want to talk to you for the next few moments that we're here. I want to talk to you about a call to personal action. Follow me now if you're taking notes or on your smartphone. This is very, very important. A call to personal action. Now let me highlight the main focus of their conversation found in verse number 18. It is found here in verse 18. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Now that was a powerful statement. Now I was thinking of calling this message, God in us or you in God. And I was thinking about it and thinking about it because the truth is this, church. The moment you and I get saved or, or born again, we actually have been called to, a, to, to personal action, to do something. Somebody shout amen. The, the, the moment you get born again, the moment you come to Christ, it, it's not just about accepting Christ. It's doing something with it. Oh, you didn't hear me here this morning. Let, let me backtrack. The moment you and I get born again, the moment you and I get saved, the moment you and I come to Jesus, we have been enlisted to a personal call to do some personal action. What do I mean by this? I'll show you the next statement. That you and I are called to do something for the kingdom. Somebody shout something. Come on, somebody. Somebody shout something. The moment I get born again, the moment you get born again, each and every one of us whom God has saved, the moment we get born again, we have been called to personal action. Each and every one of us here. We're called to do something for the kingdom. That's very vital. That's very important. That is going to cause you to go from a, just a normal dredge 
drudge, boring Christian life to a life that's exciting, a life that's going somewhere, a life with purpose. Do you hear what I'm saying here this morning? To help build the kingdom of God, to help build the local church, even to evangelize and win our family and our friends and our community for the kingdom of God. Listen, church. Listen, make no mistake, Jesus didn't save you and set you free just to come to church and sit week after week. Come on, somebody. Did, did you hear me? Jesus didn't set you free and deliver you just so that you can come every Sunday and you can get fed and we can just sing a few songs. Jesus didn't set you free just to be a Sunday Christian. I'm here to let you know that your life has purpose. We're here for something bigger than ourselves. Somebody shout amen. We're here for something bigger than ourselves. Personal action means I got something to contribute. I got something to give back. Jesus set me free because I have something to give back. God set you free because you have something to give back. He didn't set you free just because you were lost. He didn't set you free just because you were broken hearted and you were lost and bound. No. No, no, Jesus sets us free intentionally and with a purpose. There's a reason why you're here this Sunday morning. There's a reason why you're in this church. And there's a reason why you're hearing this message. We have been called to personal action, to contribute, to commit, to participate. Let me repeat that. It's worth repeating. Let me tell you what personal action means. It means I'm going to contribute something. I'm going to commit something to the kingdom. I'm going to participate in the local church, and I'm going to do something with my life. The moment Jesus set me free and delivered me, I knew that it wasn't just to get me off drugs. I knew it wasn't just to get me off alcohol. I knew it wasn't just for me to, to roll up my bank account or my 401k plan. I understood that the moment Jesus set me free, Max had a purpose. I had a reason for living now. Somebody shout amen. You're no different. You're no different. You're here because there's an actual purpose for your life. There's an actual purpose. You see, I don't believe that we are called to do nothing. There is a reason why God saved us. I believe that God would have all of us serve in one capacity or another in the kingdom so that we can build his house. Whose house? His house. Whose house? His house. His house. So God has to set us free from those addictions. And God has to set us free from that lifestyle of sin so that God can bring us into a place where he can equip us, build us, and disciple us. We are a discipling ministry. Not only do we evangelize, but we disciple men and women. Our ministry is about discipleship. We want to reach. We want to teach. We want to equip. And we want to disciple people for the kingdom. Somebody shout amen. And there's a reason for that. Now Jesus said something very powerful to his disciples that I really don't think they got it. And I hope you can get it this morning. They didn't get it. He said, yes, they did. No, they did not get it. He said something so powerful. I think they couldn't grasp what Jesus was telling them at this time. Maybe because they were too young in the Lord. Maybe they were not mature enough. I really don't know the facts in this particular story. But Jesus was emphasizing to them that he was the solid rock. Follow me now. Let me teach something for a few minutes. Jesus was teaching something so, so profound that many churches have missed it. And some have even created different doctrines over this statement. And Jesus begins to tell the disciples, I am the rock in which the church is going to be built upon. Follow me now. Jesus said, I am the rock that the church is going to be built upon. And Peter and the disciples and the rest of you Christians are going to belong to that rock. I'm going somewhere. Now, contrary to what some churches are teaching today, they say that Jesus was referring to Peter as the rock. Well, it's incorrect. Let me tell you why. Peter in Greek here means Petros. Petros. Say it with me, Petros. And that means a fragment, a little piece of the rock. 
But the rock that is referred to here in scripture is Petra. Say it with me, Petra. Petros, a little fragment of a rock. Petra, a massive living rock. And when Jesus was saying, I am the rock, Jesus was saying, I am the massive living rock that the church is built upon. Somebody ought to give him praise. Come on, somebody. And it is in this foundation that your, your salvation has to hinge on. Sometimes people leave church. Sometimes they get mad at a brother and a sister. They get mad at a pastor. And they, come, they stop coming to church. The reason they stop coming to church is because their foundation is not on that rock. Their foundation is on people. Listen, I didn't save you. I couldn't even save myself. The one that saved you is the one who built the rock. His name is Jesus. And we have to be careful, church, that when somebody's working with us or somebody's discipling us or somebody's discipling uh, you, that you don't get bent out of shape and you get mad and you stop coming to church. No. If we want to be true followers of Jesus, there's going to be times we're going to worship God, times we're going to celebrate, and even times that God is going to deal with us. Somebody shout amen. And Jesus begins to make this declaration. Jesus is saying that he is going to build his church. Whose church? church. Whose church? church? And the gates of hell, which means the powers of the enemy would not be able to stop this growth. The power of the enemy could not overcome the power of God. The expansion of the mission that God has intended for his church will be accomplished regardless, in spite of. Follow me now. This is what's happening. Listen, let me tell you something very, very, very quickly and briefly. Ever since Jesus landed on planet Earth, the moment that Jesus stepped on this planet, I tell you what, the enemy has been after him. The enemy's been after the purpose and the call of God. The enemy has tried to stop the work of God. He's come in through doubt and he's come in through confusion. He's come in through manipulation. He's come in through fear tactics. And he even came through persecution in the early church. And when I look at the enemy's objective, when I look at the enemy's job, he, 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 he's pretty good at what he does. Listen to me. Don't ever say, oh, the devil's a little red horn sissy. No, wait a minute. Wait. This little red horn sissy has many tactics that he has taken out a lot of men and women of God. So I think we better enter into this fight knowing who our opponent is. Somebody say amen. Listen, I don't know if you've ever been in a good fight. I have. I've been in some good fights, man, where you get your scruples knocked out of you. Right? Out in the world, some of us have been in some good fights. And, and, and yes, we can say, oh, I beat up everybody. Yeah, but you were fighting kids. We're talking. I beat up six. I, I beat up six people, but you didn't tell us they were girls. Come on now. <laughs> but if you've ever been in a good fight, you know. You know what I'm talking about, sisters. Oh, you brothers too. I had a sister. She might be watching this on TV. I had a sister, believe it or not. She was a fighter. I was, I was, a, I was afraid of her when I was a kid. This girl could fight. Boom. Boom. I said, you're not supposed to fight like that. You're a woman. You're a girl. Put on your girl pants. Stop putting on your boy pants. You're a girl. She was a fighter, one of my sisters. And I don't know if you've ever been in a good fight, but when you get into a good fight, obviously you got to know who your opponent is. Somebody shout amen. amen. You cannot jump in the ring without knowing who that other person is. Right? Listen, I don't mean to brag. I didn't win every fight. We would like to tell you that, especially I'm on TV. I beat up everybody. But there might be a guy watching that will tell me, I beat you up. Don't be lying. <laughs> but I fought in the ring because I was a martial arts teacher for many years. And being in the ring, man, sometimes you fight, you win some, and you lose some. Somebody say amen. amen. But let me tell you something. You have to know your opponent. I think as born-again believers, as, as we're building the work of God, as we're building the kingdom, we have to know that there's a real enemy out there that's after our soul. Somebody shout amen. amen. Higher the calling, higher the attack. Did you hear me? 
the, the enemy's going to hit. I don't know what happened to me. I do. I don't know why I left God. I do. I don't know why I went back to drugs and alcohol. I do. Because we underestimated the power of the enemy. And, and you cannot underestimate the power of the enemy. Oh, I can take the devil. He's a punk. You can call him whatever you want. But the devil is strong. The devil, the Bible calls him the father of lies. He's crafty. He's a conniver. He has centuries over us doing the same tactic, the same lies. Even today, the enemy is at work. And I believe he's working extra hard in our time and age to infiltrate not only our schools and our universities, teaching our kids that God is non-existent, that we are masters of our own destiny. We need nobody else. And the God of self taking care of me, myself, and I should be the ultimate goal for us that are born again. How many know that's a lie? Somebody shout amen. Even God reminds us that we're called to something bigger than just ourselves. Look at your the neighbor. Tell him you're called to something bigger than just self. Listen, church. I, I need us to understand this. We're called to something bigger than just serving myself. That's the truth. Somebody say amen. amen. The, even the Apostle Paul reminds us, write this down in Ephesians 2.20, that together with the apostles and the prophets, we are part of God's church. We are part of building the kingdom of God together. Listen, my friends. There is a bigger purpose why God has chosen you and me. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Just in case you didn't hear this morning, let me repeat it again. There is a real bigger purpose why God has chosen you and me. God wants to use our life to reach others. Somebody shout amen. God wants to use our life to impact others. God wants to use our life to spread the message of the gospel. God wants to use us. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his vocal piece. I wouldn't be here unless someone was bold as a lion, had guts to come to my house and tell me that Jesus loves me. You heard it. You heard it. I've said the story a hundred times. I don't get tired of talking about that story because the person that witnessed to me was not a big, bad dude. It was a small girl that was about four feet tall, one inch, weighing about 90 pounds. And I remember the day she came to my house and she pointed her finger at me looking up. She goes, I know you think you're bad. But Jesus loves you and Jesus can set you free. I was crazy enough to believe that young lady. 37 years later, that message of the gospel has kept me. Sometimes we're afraid to do street evangelism. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Just tell them that Jesus loves them. The girl that reached my wife and I, she never broke a dish in her life. I think the biggest, the biggest sin she ever had committed, I think she lied. For us lying, oh my God, that was part of our life. <laughs> Amen, somebody? Stop lying now. There's a bigger purpose why God has chosen you. You were talking about that, weren't you, Adam? That there's a bigger purpose. I don't even think you've told your dad, so I'm going to help you. He was telling me he has a bigger purpose, Adam. A bigger purpose than what dad has for him. Let me tell you something. We're not going to look at your dad right now because he's looking at me. It's important that you fulfill your God-given purpose and not my dad's God-given purpose. I taught that to my kids growing up in church. Listen, I have a purpose for you. I want you to do this, 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 and this, and this. Listen, mom and dads, we can turn our kids off for the Lord. Then all of a sudden I started growing up as a parent. I said, you know what? I don't want you to do what I do. I want you to find your own identity in the kingdom. I want you to find your own identity with Jesus Christ. Let him do whatever God wants to do with you. When we do that, they're able to flourish and blossom and grow. Somebody shout amen. Listen, God has a bigger purpose for our life than we have for ourselves. Did you hear me? Somebody say amen. amen. Did you know that? Mom, dad, sister, brother, businessman. Because we have everybody here. 
Sometimes we think we have it all figured out. I know I did. Oh, this is what God's going to do in my life. This is the way he's going to do it. And this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And God says, no. I got something different than your plan, son. All you got to do is learn how to surrender to me. Somebody shout amen. amen. We used to sing a song, Musanda. I don't know if we sing it anymore. And it's an oldie. <clears throat> I think it's in the key of G. And we used to sing the song that used to go like this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus. Blessed Savior. I surrender all. I surrender all. And I'm getting bold. I surrender all, all to Jesus, blessed Savior, I surrender all. Don't book me, don't book me. But listen, I'm here to let you know that there, God has a bigger purpose and a bigger plan for us than we do for ourselves. If somebody believes that, I want you to give Jesus a hand of praise. Listen, that's why in the kingdom of God, everybody's important. Everybody. Even those of you sitting in the back. And I know you sit in the back for some reason or another. Maybe you have children. Maybe your husband acts up. I don't know your husband. And so you sit in the back. I don't know why. But it's okay. That's the only place you can find. But God raises everybody. God has a purpose and a plan for everybody, every type of individual, every type of person, personality, every type of race and social class. Why? Because everybody's uniqueness builds the kingdom of God. Thank God we don't all look like me. Don't get too happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God we don't all look like you. Oh, God have mercy if we did. Kevin. Thank God there's only two of you. He's a twin. He's a twin. He's a twin. We're not supposed to be alike in features. But we are to be alike in vision and in heart and in purpose. Come on, somebody. Uh, all of us here ought to have the same vision and purpose that I'm here to contribute. I'm here to give back. I'm here to do something for the kingdom. Amen, somebody? Check this out. God has chosen the church to be the place where people can come and worship with other believers. Where people can come and be inspired by the preaching of the word. Where people can come and help be a part of something bigger than themselves. The moment that you see that the purpose of God, the plan of God is bigger than yourself, then you're going to see something totally different. You're going to say, oh my God, no wonder God set me free. No wonder God saved us. No wonder God put my marriage back together. God has saved us for a greater purpose than just serving ourselves. Somebody help me shout amen. We have been called to personal action. God is looking for people here this Sunday morning that will rise up and do something. We need some of you to rise up and do something for the kingdom. We need some of you to rise up and make a difference in other people's lives. We need somebody that's going to answer the call of God. Maybe God is calling some of you to do a life group. Oh, I can't teach. Don't worry, half of us can't either. Or maybe... God's calling you to teach the children or start some community outreach so that we can reach the people from the streets or do something that we're not doing yet. I trip out when people say, you guys ain't got this and you ain't got that. I says, that's right. We don't have this and we don't have that because we were waiting for you. Right? Oh, my other church. Well, you should have stood in that other church. But I'm happy you're here with us. I really am. We're happy you're here. God's brought you here for a reason. I left my other church because they didn't do this. Don't, don't worry about that. No, no, no. You're here 
Because I really believe in my heart that you feel that God has called you here. And now that you're here, let's roll up our sleeves and let's get busy. Let's get busy. Let's get busy building the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Okay, let me do a little bit more teaching. Check this out. This verse, of verse 18, speaks about something other than. There is a, a statement in bibliology that we use called census planur. Census planur has the meaning that the scripture has this meaning and it also has this meaning. That's called census planur, where something that you read may have more than one meaning. Now, this scripture here has another meaning besides, because when we look at this Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Obviously, we use that scripture just for reaching the community, reaching different continents, but it goes deeper than that. This verse in Matthew 20, 18, 28, 19, this verse speaks about impacting the place of our surrounding. Follow me now, follow. This is heavy, this is good. When I, when I read this, I said, this is good. Now, when Jesus tells us, I need you guys to help me build my church. I need you to evangelize. I need you to disciple people. What does that mean? It means not just going to Africa, not just going to Mexico. No, it means to start impacting the place of your surrounding. What does that mean? That we are, we are to impact the place where we work at where we go to school at, the neighborhood where we live in. In other words, Jesus is saying, I need you to reach those people whom you associate with. I want you to reach those people whom you hang out with. I want you to reach those people whom you work with. Amen, somebody. Do you see the scope of our reach and impact goes beyond just uh, uh, the circle of influence. Yes, we got to reach those that we know, but then the circle of influence must expand. I got to be able to reach somebody at work. I got to be able to reach somebody in the neighborhood. I got to reach somebody at the mall or someone at school. Somebody shout amen. amen. See, we have a responsibility to grow in our love for other people. Don't ever become cold-blooded. We, we got to increase in our love for other people. Somewhere down the line, as we become born again, sometimes we can become desensitized and, and we don't care about people like we should. And we got to care and we got to love other people. We got to care about other people. We must be willing to reach other people for the kingdom. Can somebody shout amen? amen. This is what it means to be the church. We are not merely responsible for our own spiritual well-being. We are responsible to help other people. Quickly, let me, let me just give you three things and we'll finish. Number one, check it out. Call to personal action means this. That you will begin to look at people around you differently. Because everybody matters to God. Say it with me, everybody matters. Come on, say it, everybody matters. Start looking at other people differently. I didn't mean strange or weird. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Because it doesn't matter how they look. It doesn't matter how they dress. Forgive me, I know that the Christian church gets all caught up with suits and girls have to wear dresses. That's not true. That's not true. I, I asked my leaders to put on suits and all that so that we can look presentable before you. But if I wasn't up here, I'd probably be dressed with a nice pair of slacks and a shirt. The suit doesn't make me who I am. Listen, sister, that dress doesn't make you who you are. It's about your heart. So you see a lot of our leaders with suits and ties, amen, more power to them. But that is not what we're looking for. We're looking for people we can reach, right? People we can impact. So we got to look at people around us a little bit different. It doesn't matter how they look or how they dress or what background they come from or, or, or listen to this one, or how messy their life is. Some of you have a very messy life. I had a very messy life. You too. That's why you're getting nervous as I'm looking at you.
and we try to hide. Some of us had a messy life. Come on, somebody. Our life was messy. Sometimes we come into the church with all kinds of hang-ups, with all kinds of baggage, and we know that God still loves them. Come on, somebody shout amen. God still loves that messy person. Just as much as God loved us. Sometimes I think what happens when you've been saved a little while, you forget how messy you really were. Right? You didn't always dress like that. You didn't always look that cute, brother. Right? Now we brush our teeth. Some of you even have new teeth now. Comb our hair, if you have any. And the moment Jesus does something in us, it's important that we don't forget how messy we came out of. We need to know that God has called us to reach messy people. If we are looking for religious folks, we are in the wrong place. Come on, somebody give Jesus a hand of praise. Oh, listen to me. God didn't call us to reach other Christians. Now, other Christians will come because they fall in love with our vision and our mission. But don't you dare forget what we're called to do. God has called us to go and reach the hurting, to go and reach the lost, to go and reach those that are messy. Second of all, quickly. Call to personal action means that God, put, look at number two, God has placed these people in your path so that you would do everything you can to reach them, connect them, and invite them to church. Somebody shout amen. Did you think it was coincidence that somebody handed you a flyer? Do you think it's coincidence that somebody invited you to church? Do you think it's coincidence that somebody told you Victory Outreach Portland has a Christian recovery home for men and women? You can come for free, and God can set you free, and God can deliver you, and God can give you purpose. It wasn't coincidence. You're here because God saw the bigger picture in your life. Jesus was clear about his purpose on earth. He said in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save those that are lost. Amen, somebody. We too must be clear about our purpose. God has placed his church. Listen to me. I'm grateful where our church is located. I had other pastors tell me, ooh, people are going to want to go there because it's kind of in the neighborhood. I says, brother, that's exactly where we want to be at. As I was doing television for TBN years ago, and I was interviewing a top-notch pastor. He tells me, hey, Brother Max, you know that if you go to that other side of the city, you'll reach a lot of good people with a lot of money. And I go, really? <laughs> then I got a little sarcastic. Hey, brother, did I ever tell you that I was suffering from some identity complex? I know who I am, and I know whom God has called me to reach. God has called us to reach the treasures out of darkness, those that are, that, that are hidden in secret places, so that God, the God of Israel, will get glorified when people like you and me get saved. I need to tell you, we must remember that he has called us to be the light in the midst of darkness. If you haven't walked around the neighborhood, listen, get off your nice car. Get off your high horse. Stop, start walking just outside of these doors. Why don't you come at 10 o'clock at night? Maybe 12. You might be considering packing because you might get attacked. <laughs> I meant packing the Bible. What did you think I meant? Yeah, I was talking about packing the Bible. Did you think something else? 
Because when you hang out in these streets in the middle of the night, you better make sure you have backup. Some guy says, oh, I always have somebody with me. I says, who? Smith and Wesson. I says, those two guys, they're unreliable. But I always got the Lord. I always got Jesus. I always got God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I always got that, human, that, that heavenly trinity on my side. As a matter of fact, the greatest commandments, the, the two, the two greatest commandments in the Bible are these. You know it. You know it. It's found in Mark 12, verse 28. Love God with all your heart, spirit, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it something that God says, I need you to love me? Then I want you to love the people that are lost. Isn't that something? God doesn't say, just love the goody goody. No, Jesus is saying, I want you to love those that are messy. Love those that are that, that, that are a pain in the neck. Love those that nobody else wants to love. Reach those that nobody else wants to reach. Start doing something for the kingdom that's going to bring God glory. Love is what motivates us to reach out. The only reason that we can love, the only reason I can love somebody else, because I don't forget how much God loved me. I'm the black sheep of my family. I'm the baby of 10, and I know what it is to mess up. I know what it is to, to feel least the black sheep. But man, the moment Jesus saw me, and he says, that's the one I want. That's the one I love. I'm going to embrace him, and I'm going to raise him up, and I'm going to put a purpose and, and a plan for him bigger than what he has for himself. Listen to me. Love is what motivates us to reach others. Paul said it in Romans 5.5, 5, we are transformed by love because God has been poured. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Listen, we're called to reach out to those that are lost, to those who are needing Christ. But let me say this. If everything we do is not done out of love, then we've missed the mark. And we only want to do things to be seen. And we want pats in the back. And we want the spotlight. And we want to be the best preacher in town. And I want to have, I want to be on television. Oh, friend. We're only on here because it's free. <laughs> We're only on here because we know our purpose. We're here to reach a lost and dying world. You and I are called to build the kingdom, not to build ourselves. We have enough Christian superstars on television. We need to, to highlight the real superstar whose name is Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Let me close. Let me close. That's, that's enough. Lastly, I'll just give you this. This is enough. Call to personal action means call that you will do your part in helping others become not only followers, but disciples of Jesus Christ. Listen, check this out. Maybe, maybe Musanda, here he comes. Play one of my favorite songs, Musanda. I wonder what that one is. You know that new one we're talking about? He's a way maker. Mm -hmm. Check this out, my friend. Please try not to move around. I'm about to tell you something very, very important. Maybe God is laying someone in your heart today that you perhaps don't know very well. They're probably here in church. They're probably at your job site in the same company where you're at. The first step you should do is try to build some type of relationship with them. Maybe it's someone you've known for years and God is calling you to take that relationship to another level. Somebody say with me, another level. Some relationships have to be taken to another level in order for them to allow you to minister to them. Don't think people are going to allow you to speak into their life just because you're a Christian. 
They've seen too many phony Christians already. So you got to build a relationship with them. Let them see that you're for real. Once they see that you're for real, then they'll let you speak into their life. Follow me, follow me. Perhaps God has placed you where you're at in your job and that university and school. And the people around you are not there by accident. Keep in mind that the Great Commission calls us to every type of person, to those inside the church as well as those outside of the church, to those who are like us and to those who are not like us. Everyone needs to understand who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. So God has to use us. Out of 114 times that church is mentioned in the New Testament, 90 of them refer to local gatherings of believers who come together regularly and we worship and we fellowship together, but then we fulfill mission together. It ain't just about fellowshipping and worshiping. It's about fulfilling something. The message of this morning is simple. God has called us to do something. Say it with me, something. Let that resonate in your heart and your mind. Say it with me, something. Stand with me because you got to really say it from your spirit. I want you to say, God has called me to do something. Come on, say it with me. God has called me to do something. Stand, stand with me, stand with me. Lift up your hands like this. Please, no moving around. I want you to say, God has called me. Make it personal, me, to do something. We have a mission to fulfill, and that's to build the church of God, this church where God has placed us. We've all been called to do something for the kingdom. Listen to what I'm about to tell you right now. This is key. Don't move if you don't have to, because you'll miss the whole message. I saved the last statement for last for a reason. But turn down the lights so they can just see up here, and you don't get distracted by people that are moving around. We have all been called to do something for the kingdom. Here it is. Your responsibility. My responsibility is to discover exactly what it is that God is calling me to do to help build His church. That's it. That's it. What is it that God has called me to do to help build this church? Lift up your hands. Do you know what it is? Do you know what God has called you for to help build the church? Not to do your own agenda, God's agenda. Not to build your own thing, but to build God's thing. Not, not, not to build your, your own self, no, build the kingdom of God. What is it that God is calling you to do to help build His church? Throw your hands up in the air. They're going to sing this beautiful song. I want you to remember what I just said. Take me back to the title. That's what he is. Hello, my name is Max Garza. This is my wife, Linda. We are the pastors of the Victory Outreach Church here in the beautiful city of Portland, Oregon. I pray that you've been blessed with today's message. I want to invite you to come and be a part of one of our services, either on Wednesday at 7 p.m. or Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We are located in the corner of 160th and Southeast Start. And we have a great church that's been waiting for you and your entire family to come on out and visit us. God bless you. We'll wait for you. We'll see you soon. God bless you.